Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu showed two maps at the UN General Assembly last Friday. One map was labeled the curse, featuring Iran, Iraq, Syria and Yemen painted in black. In contrast, the second map was titled the blessing. It highlighted nations like Egypt, Sudan, Saudi Arabia and India in green. Now, the India Middle East Europe economic corridor that Netanyahu indicated on those maps was launched in New Delhi during the G20 summit last September. However, less than a month later, Hamas's attack on Israeli civilians sparked off a war that's still raging. And in fact, it's spreading. The theater of conflict is spreading. It stalled progress on the IMEC. India is already invested in a new port in Haifa. Businessman Gautam Adani has bought that Israeli port. Now, can IMEC, this grand US-led connectivity project, link uh, India to the Gulf and to Europe beyond that? Or is this to be shelved, given the kind of impact that we are seeing on the region now with an escalation in the conflict? Joining me to discuss this today are Dr. Swasti Rao, Associate Fellow at the MPIDSA, and Pramit Pal Chaudhary from the Eurasia Group. Welcome to the News 9 Plus show. Pramit, what's your forecast for the IMEC? Have the hopes for it brightened after uh, what Benjamin Netanyahu held out in the UN uh, General Assembly? Or is it work in progress? It's going to take a couple of more years before we can even start talking about it seriously. Well, as you know, it was only announced last year, right? Uh, the ITU2, which is yeah. the one that Israel, the United Arab Emirates, the US and India had announced a few years earlier, had been already in play, if you wish. IMEC in many ways overlays on top of that. It adds right. a little bit more element uh, in the energy sphere, for example. Um, so IMEC, yes, it's on hold. Uh, in many ways, it should we say it has never really taken off because we haven't had time for it to come through. Right. But what we are going to be seeing, and I think we're seeing that definitely with both the IT2 projects that are coming through uh, even now, is that the, if you wish, the Western element of it, the Western yes. so West corridor yes. is frozen because the Western corridor requires right. has to go through Israel and Saudi Arabia uh, has already said that we cannot progress until there is a Palestinian peace process. Absolutely, now. yes. Um, and the peace process, they don't say that the peace process has to succeed. It's just that it has to have one. Yes. They have to see that. Right. So, so they're waiting for, if you wish, in my view, a political fig leaf that right. allows to resume IMEC on the Western side, right. which incorporates things like Haifa, uh, uh, Aqaba, the port in Jordan, the Etihad rail system running through uh, from the Gulf uh, yes. into, uh, into the Levant area. The Eastern Corridor, which yeah. is the part connecting India to the Gulf, however, continues. Right. Uh, India had already announced, uh, I think earlier this year, that they would continue their projects that they had lined up on, on the, the ports and, and infrastructure. Uh, the agro parks that are being paid for by the UAE uh, right. are coming up one by one. Um, and the trade between those two, two countries, uh, UAE and India in particular, has blossomed. Saudi Arabia, we're waiting now for the Gulf Cooperation Council FTA negotiations to be completed. We've done one with UAE, one with Oman. Yes. So the Gulf one, once that's done, the FTA, none of that has stopped. Right. Um, from what the media reports have said, UAE in particular has already signaled, and we saw uh, Bin Zayed visit India recently, uh, the Crown Prince, that we are not, we are not slowing down on the eastern yes. side of right. our program. Right. Saudi Arabia has many other things at play as well, um, but we'll see. I think we'll see something similar happen with them. Uh, their commitment. In fact, I would argue both Abu Dhabi and Riyadh are basically of the view that to show that our giant uh, sort of strategic connectivity projects are still yes. alive, despite Gaza, despite yes. what's happened to Israel and Hezbollah, it is India where we have to show that. Right put in more money, if anything. Uh, some reports say the UAE and Saudi Arabia are considering committing another $50 billion uh, right. to these projects to show that this project is not dead yet, Right. Uh, whatever anybody may think. Right. So this, uh, Dr. Rao, this, uh, uh, do you see this as what Pramit uh, just mentioned, the fact that the eastern end of all these projects will continue. 
while the west the western part which is actually the chicken's neck pramit the the very crucial saudi israel uh, peace process that is so crucial to realizing imec um, but uh, you know dr rao so the fact is that will imec be in the next couple of years a very diluted uh, a watered down version and imec light if you can call it just a im e without the e n c you know will that be a reality you know given the fact how tense the situation is in uh, the in west asia currently your thoughts well i mean my thoughts are like this that i think it's uh, we are sort of uh, always making a kind of a strategic error when we are referring to the eastern part as uh, the uh, railroad and the ship links and everything connecting mm. india to the uh, to the west asian region and then in the west asian region we we think that the imec ends no uh, it was a g7 back project it was a pgii yes. initiative mm. and ultimately you have to think of imec as three components one is the component that links in India to the to West Asia. Yeah. The other component is what is happening in West Asia because if you know, if you know, if you are aware of the roots, uh, yes. you know, once you are uh, you've left Bombay and you've reached uh, um, uh, you know West Asia and then it changes, it goes inside Saudi Arabia and from Saudi Arabia then yeah. it goes all the way to Haifa, right? So then there's this this a dynamic which is within West Asia, which in my opinion is the second leg, and the third part is that how then it links to Europe yes. and. Um, unfortunately whatever discussions we've been having in india somehow center around india and west asia and then it kind of ends at west asia because right mm. now you know that uh, the normalization that was underway which was you know between saudi arabia and israel and all these that obviously could not be completed as pramit pointed yes. and the other thing is that with all the uh, peace proposition which remains as fragile as ever with respect when what is happening today between israel and iran and lebanon and all this wider conflict yes. that is happening it looks very very improbable that anything uh, like connecting diverse geographies for economic benefit probably would come but yes. at the end of the day you have to understand that everybody that was backing imec was actually people from the west okay yes. so yes. how can you be you talking about that if you don't talk about that leg like, okay so very quickly what the way i look at it you know three four things one is that imec in its current form i honestly think it's a non starter right? right i mean on uh, that's that's the first thing i think we need to sort of understand that no matter how uh, what kind of diplomatic um, uh, push what kind of a diplomatic uh, support have we tried to garner for the imec obviously because it came out at the G20 summit which india was presiding over yes. it is very clear that you know we had invested the saudi arabians a bit especially uh, you know the saudis were the ones that actually committed any money initially yes. okay and i think they were very very clear they also wanted to tap into the european market so i guess the diplomatic support and that kind of a, a goodwill is something that we all understand but the other thing is the realistic bit which is that the situation inside west asia yeah. remains to be precarious and and you know sandeep the larger thing is that even if peace were to return see yes. what happened after i2 u2 what basically what happened after abraham accords was that everybody thought that things are now going to go towards yes. normalization then i2 u2 came and everybody went gaga and said that all right now the, here we are we entering this new era of normalization and right. after i2 u2 uh, then uh, then came imec and imec the first idea came from michael kanchum's study in 2021 yes. which was about how can you sort of add to the uh, economic dividend if you were to connect diverse geographies by that uh, uh, you know by, by 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 what he proposed and all of that was sounding great till the time hamas uh, did what it did to israel and then right. as we the rest is history and uh, even after more than a year we know that things are far from normal in fact yes. the situation is only only getting more escalatory and more uh, dangerous so by that even if peace were to return what i wish to hear state is that even if peace were to return sandeep it is going mm. to be a fragile peace and then it becomes very very difficult because remember it's a pgii bat initiative if you look yes. at how the financing for imec was to come the financing was coming from de risking uh, private capital how are you going to convince anybody in the world to de risk capital in these regions yes. so this is of course in my opinion a very complicated thing but what i wish to sort of also convey uh, you know through your show is that i don't yes. think the government of india is sitting and waiting for the situation in west asia to uh, to come back to normal yes. or whatever remain normal i think if you look carefully at how india has been uh, ramping up its effort uh, when uh, um, to to connect to the european markets right yes. so you what you see is that the eastern leg of imec is working and also the western leg of the imec is working because yes. india's mediterranean strategy when india is talking about you know not just 
areas, but also Thessaloniki today. Thessaloniki yes. is another Greek port, which is connected to the Three Seas Initiative, which is about you know 13, 14 countries of Central and East Europe with a combined GDP of over one trillion. And these, uh, all these, uh, you know, economies are connected by what is called the Three Seas Initiative, which is basically again a multimodal uh, connectivity corridor that connects all these uh, economies. So India is looking at building uh, ties with Thessaloniki, not yes. just Piraeus, which is dominated by again by by China. They are also now reaching out to Marseille, which is south of France. Yes. Now, because all of our trade right now to Europe is concentrated through uh, uh, Rotterdam and Hamburg, which are ports in Germany. So they are uh, oversaturated, but we have new strategic partnerships. So we're looking at Thessaloniki in Greece. We're looking at Marseille in Paris, uh, I mean, in south of France. We're looking at Trieste in Italy, which is another port. So what I'm trying to say is that I think that the the uh, that what we demand right now, the, the demand of the time or the rational demand of the time yeah. is that we should let West Asia uh, figure out its problem. You know, India's yes. official start on it. But at the same time, there is no reason why we should not be really trying to connect these diverse geographies uh, in, in, uh, in a win-win situation by trying to connect different uh, ports, which are from India's perspective, not yet dominated by China. So the yes. way I look is that that is the missing jigsaw that we often not talk about, which is about what is happening in the western side of the IMEC. The yeah. missing piece of the puzzle. And in fact, uh, Dr. Rao, we were in Israel just last week, and uh, that's the, also the sense that I got from uh, the Israeli uh, experts that we spoke to that, listen, get along with the rest of the IMEC, uh, you know, fit in all the other pass, uh, pieces of the infrastructure puzzle, and then we can talk about that crucial West Asia part, which is still... Uh, held hostage by what's going on there right now. But, you know, uh, Deepak, one wonders, at the eerie timing of Hezbollah, or my mistake, the Hamas's attack on Israel in October 2023, Benjamin Netanyahu stands up exactly like this to the UN. He holds up this peace plan for the Middle East, uh, a map showing the uh, IMEC corridor, and it's announced in the G20 summit, of course, and then Less than a month later, there is this huge attack on Israeli civilians, uh, which completely disrupts IMEC and puts it on the back burner. I mean, did, did Hamas actually do this to uh, target the Middle East corridor with Europe? Uh, so this is kind of like jumping down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. But, but what you can look at is, uh, what are the countries that the Houthis have not targeted ever? Yes. Right. Who benefits out of the present situation? Now, India had, uh, you know, we had no horse in this race. We right. were friendly with everyone. And yet, Indian commercial shipping was one of the targets. Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the attacks happened just 200 kilometers off the coast of Mumbai, right. which is a red line for India. But crucially, no Chinese vessel, it appears, yes. has ever been targeted. You do not hear reports of a Russian vessel or Russian crews being harassed. Uh, now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that somebody may have ordered, you know, such an act, but it does sound suspiciously... Yeah, we're not being, uh, we're not peddling any conspiracy theories <laughs> here, but, you know, as they say, events, events, dear boy. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Pramit, this, uh, you know, India is also part of the INSTC, which is the North-South Transport Corridor going via Iran into Russia and into Europe after that. What are the options, what are the chances of the INSTC taking off given the fact that Iran, which is again a key component of the, uh, this, this corridor and of course the Russian Federation itself, uh, two blocks at war, India in the middle, what hope for the INSTC? So um, the INSTC, as you know, has been, uh, has been going on, on I mean, at verbally and rhetorically now for about 15, 20 years, I guess. Right. Uh, nothing much has happened. Uh, it, it succeeded in one element in that it allowed India to provide support to the to the pre-Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, uh, and that, that worked the Herat, uh, Chabahar, uh, Bandar Abbas link um, and allowed Afghanistan a degree of freedom from Pakistan. Um, but that uh, the other element, which is the idea, was to take it further up into Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and eventually to Russia, never took off. And I think it didn't take off for two main reasons. 
Um, Iran was not very interested in getting it to go further. Uh, it saw that as a potential way for Russia to develop influence in Iran, but didn't see Iran picking up any favors on the other side. I mean, ultimately, Russia and Central Asia are gas and oil exporting nations. Yes. So is Iran. Uh, so what are you going to actually sell on this on this corridor? Um, and Russia was not invested in it. Russia, the train, the problem was that the, it was basically a it was basically a truck corridor. It went, you had to put a container on a truck and then drive it up and down. Very inefficient, very slow, very small quantities of traffic. The rail link there was extremely poor. Neither Iran or Russia were prepared to pay for it. We now see a bit of a change. One, because Russia and Iran are in a better position, their relationship is better. Uh, and we see Russia, thanks to Western sanctions, now mm. looking for alternative corridors to move right products of different varieties. So Russia has announced that they would put in, I think, $1.7 billion into building up the train infrastructure, which means that only one small segment left in Iran has, has left to be upgraded. Right. If Iran carries that out, then this becomes a viable corridor. Right. But when I've talked to Russians, uh, officials, they've said, well, keep in mind, there is another north-south corridor, which is fully functional, which runs from Astrakhan in yes. the Caspian through northern Iran, down to Bandar Abbas. Right. Uh, and that is already functional. They said that is, that is a perfectly workable, uh, that is already seeing about somewhere about 100 containers a week moving. Um, we're moving about 50 containers a week, I think, via the older north-south corridor, yes. uh, which is why you're having reports of Indian bananas now being sold in, in, in St. Petersburg and so on. Right. Um, but it's that investment that will take place. But it's a land corridor. Right. Um, and the what exactly Russia will sell to Iran and vice versa, which in many ways has to be the core of that trade, uh, is not very clear. Right. Uh, closing comments, uh, Dr. Rao, this INSTC versus uh, IMEC. Uh, do you see INSTC mm -hmm. being, a, is it an either or uh, a situation or is it that you see India using both corridors to trade with Europe? Very quickly, just two points. The first is that, you know, I was listening to what Deepak said about look at uh, what uh, whose ships are those that are not targeted. And yes, yes. in January, uh, the yeah, the Houthis uh, spokesperson, you know, I think the Houthis uh, uh, senior official, Mohammed al Bukhaiti, yes. he did state that Russian and Chinese ships will not be attacked. So there have been explicit guarantees given to Russian and Chinese ships passing right. from the Red Sea that they will not be attacked. And there have been some attacks, but because that is because the Houthis data, the data that they were tracking was outdated and they did not know that those ships uh, that they landed up attacking were actually bought by Chinese later. So that's the only exception that has happened. So yes, right. that that really does speak of uh, uh, the kind of this alliance which is coming up and one yes. has to be careful. Okay, that's that's the first part. The other thing about INSTC, well, the other problem, uh, you know, adding to what just Pramit was saying in terms of uh, what really remains uh, uh, in certain issues with INSTC and it remains a bit of a limited kind of an overture yeah. when it comes to economic connectivity. Uh, also know that, you know, both... Armenia and Azerbaijan are parts of I, uh, of INSTC and both yes. are warring uh, countries you know, right. right now. I mean, tensions are again soaring and uh, Armenia has wanted to come out of CSTO. Russia-Armenia relationship is not going fine. So uh, end of the day, you have to keep in mind that what exactly is going to pass through this right. and so uh, how much will it be in India's business interest to actually bus uh, to trade with sanctioned entities? Because yes. end of the day, I mean, here you are, we don't have a government that gives any kind of guarantee for the business people to come in and uh, sort of get into these kind of trades because yes. how do you recover your money? So probably, in, in my opinion, that remains to be one of the biggest uh, impediments and that's another reason why things have been so slow. But uh, to your direct question in terms of whether this remains a substitute or a complementarity, I think I think from India's point of view, we have always tried to push for uh, as many connectivities as yes. possible in a, in a more economic, multipolar uh, right. vision. And I think in that regard, I think we would still have that on we because the end of the uh, yes, we would like to keep our options open. We'd and that like to keep our options open. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao, Pramit Pal Chaudhary. Uh, India's corridor conundrum. Uh, the longer the wars in West Asia and indeed in Europe continue, the longer India's conundrum grows.